Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Tuesday, April 11th, 2023. It's good to have you on board, everybody. Today's show is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute since 1873. This is our 150th year. The members of the Naval Institute have provided the foundation for everything we do at the Naval Institute, from Proceedings and Naval History magazines to professional books from the Naval Institute Press, to conferences and events, to USNI News. Everything we do is, is uh, underwritten and, and um, supported by the members of the Naval Institute. To become a member, go to usni.org forward slash join. And if you like the show, tell your friends, ring the bell, and, and uh, subscribe to the show. Okay, so on to our guest. Uh, joining us today from Monterey, California at the Naval Postgraduate School is retired Navy Captain Jeff Klein. He's the author of this month's American Sea Power Project art article, which is titled Sea Power and the Operational Level of War, Linking Means with Ends. It starts on pages 54 and 55 of the April issue of Proceedings. Jeff, it's great to have you on the show. Well, thank you, Bill. I, I look forward to talking. So um, before we get to your article, I just, you know, you're joining us from Naval Postgraduate School. I had a chance to come out and visit you last year and visit the school. I was very impressed with a lot of the, the work that's going on at NPS. Uh, so just, you know, tell us a little bit about what are you teaching this semester and how are things going at NPS these days? Sure. In fact, if, Bill, if you remember, you're part of our Sea Power Conversations, which is very similar to uh, what uh, we're doing today, uh, having people who are uh, focused on the maritime security efforts. Uh, this quarter, I have actually, I have uh, teaching my favorite courses. I'm teaching Joint Campaign Analysis, uh, Navy Tactical Analysis, and a Systems Analysis course. The reason there is so much fun is because uh, uh, I get the students after all the uh, professors have given them all the hard math and simulation and that sort of thing. And then I uh, put them in operational or tactical environments and I say, okay, let's apply this stuff and see how we can assess risk, both of the tactical, operational, and strategic levels. And they come up with some great ideas, which is reflected somewhat in the article that I wrote. Yeah. And uh, last year, one of the things that I, I shouldn't say it was, it was surprising, but it was, it seemed like a very smart thing to do. When I was out there, you introduced me to the Dean of Research, and, and he mentioned that there's been a greater effort um, the last couple of years at NPS to sort of um, herd the cats and to make sure that there, all the different research projects that are happening out there, are there's a, a concerted effort to go after some of the urgent requirements from the numbered fleet commanders and the fleet commanders, PAC fleet, Fleet Forces Command, uh, in, in addition to just, you know, some of the other more esoteric projects that might have been happening, there's a lot of emphasis on what does the fleet need today, right? Oh, no, no, absolutely. In fact, I'm involved in some of those projects, as you might imagine. Admiral Paparo is uh, very uh, strong on having both analytics integrated into his operational level planning. And we are starting to reemphasize some of that direct involvement with the fleet's immediate requirements and needs, which I think is appropriate uh, given our current challenges today. On the other hand, we've also retained some of our basic research in robotics and unmanned systems, and that's the opportunity side. That's not the, hey, I think I need this. This is, this is an opportunity that we may be able to employ, which will change the fight. Specific example of this uh, might be uh, we have a professor that's working on an automatic controls for automatic placements of unmanned systems, uh, which will allow non uh, the inability to communicate, sorry, uh, the necessity to communicate between unmanned systems uh, won't be there anymore. Instead, they'll auto autonomously locate themselves to best support the mission. It's those sort of things that we're working hand in hand, both the requirement side uh, and the media requirement side, as well as those things which may change the way in which we operate as a Navy. Uh, so the, the, the sort of scientific and technical opportunities that, that might lead the, the way not to just something that's needed by the fleet next year and the year after that, but 10 years or 15 years down the, down the path, right? That's right. That's exactly correct. Okay, cool. All right, well, let's talk about your article for uh, a couple minutes. Uh, so it's uh, it's titled Sea Power and the Operational Level of War, Linking Means with Ends. So a lot of our listeners would be familiar with, you know, the term strategy equals ends, ways, and means. 
and the American Sea Power Project, we've been laying this out. We started with the strategic ends. Um, it's, gosh, it's been two years ago now. Uh, and now we're into the, the ways of sea power. Uh, and and your, your, your article is kind of a, an effort to, you know, sort of put the meat in the middle of the sandwich between ends and means. So um, discuss that for a minute, if you would. Well, well, I will, but I'd like to congratulate first uh, the Naval Institute for actually sponsoring this series. I think it's timely. Uh, I think the uh, the group of authors that have contributed have been really been fantastic insights uh, in what's needed. Uh, in a way, my article is sort of a back to basics. When uh, your coordinators asked me to write something about the ways of uh, navies, how they operate at sea, I said, well, there's been books written on that. Why would you want me to cover that again? But in a way, it's a back to basic thing about saying, now, wait a minute, where is our current fleet and how does it assess against these different ways, whether it's moving goods across the ocean, whether it's preventing uh, the enemy from moving goods across the ocean, uh, whether it's power projection ashore or whether it's preventing the enemy from uh, providing power projection ashore. Sort of the four ways in which uh, uh, Wayne Hughes laid out the, the, the uh, ways in which uh, Navy operates. But then assess those, and that was the real key is to say, let's go back to basics. Let's look at our fleet and see how well we stack up against each one of these when we compare these with the adversary uh, or our potential adversaries. And I think uh, it's a, an important contribution for people to start to discuss. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you start off with some helpful lists, both by Frank Ulig and Wayne Hughes. Uh, so as you as you mentioned, you know, people have written books on this, but you, you do the, the reader a, a great service by sort of condensing that down comparing and contrasting. And as you said, you know, we asked you to uh, kind of assess the Navy in those capabilities. So what do, what do Frank Ulig and Wayne Hughes have to say about the, the ways of naval warfare? Well, it's fun. If you take a look at uh, uh, Frank's, uh, what I've summarized, Frank said, he actually foreshadows much of the things we're looking at today. That is taking advanced bases. Uh, the Marine Corps stand-in forces uh, sort of reflect that capability. Uh, but, you know, projecting the ability or delivering uh, 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 bombs or Marines or services ashore, uh, also important aspects. Implementing blockades, uh, fighting fleet on fleet type operations. So uh, he, Frank, in his book, and he does an excellent job of the historical references of each one of these uh, Navy utility aspects um, uh, reinforces exactly the ways in which a person can use the Navy. Uh, Wayne summarizes it in those four things that I said before. You're either protecting goods and services on the, sh on the sea, uh, you're uh, denying the enemy the ability to do it, you are uh, projecting power ashore from the sea, which uh, is Marines, bombs, or delivering goods or services ashore, or you're preventing the enemy uh, from doing it. And quite basically, I boil everything down to just two things. You're either using the sea or keeping the enemy from using the sea uh, as sort of the real essence of the Navy itself. Now, there's lots of other things. Of course, the Navy has a unique diplomatic uh, mission uh, in many cases where our other services uh, uh uh, don't make those same diplomatic contributions. Uh, but on the most cases, when you're talking about war fighting, it boils down to those four elements. Okay. Um, yeah. And then uh, uh, when you, you go on and you write about, um, uh, you know, about those areas, fleet on fleet, fleet versus shore, fleet versus trade, and fleet in an era of maritime competition. Those are sort of the, the main um, sections of your article. Uh, so give us an assessment, if you will. How does the U.S. Navy currently rank in those ways of fighting? Well, it's a, it's a great question. In fact, that was the summary of the article itself. Uh, we have, for the last 20, 30, 40 years, uh, have really, since we won the Cold War, um, has focused on power projection. That is fleet against the shore. Uh, our ability to uh, roam the seas at will uh, to project those powers in, in limited engagements around the world, to ensure free uh, trade uh, around the world, to counter piracy, to counter smuggling, etc., has been unequal. So uh, we have continued that. Our, our adversaries, on the other hand, both with the rise of China's numbers of ships and capabilities, uh, Russia's uh, new advanced undersea capabilities, we're now seeing a challenge again in our sea control capability, that is our ability to control those seas. 
Because of that, we're returning to the concept of fleet on fleet, or at least smaller fleet engagements on smaller fleet engagements. And we find ourselves uh, a little bit on the wrong side of the, uh, the cost effectiveness curve, uh, mainly because we've been focusing on defense for so long with our weapon systems and capabilities and relying our power projection solely to be either the carrier air wing or a few uh, cruise missile capabilities, that, that we're not having to rediscover that fleet on fleet um, uh, engagement uh, aspects. And, and we're almost boiled down now to the fact that that engagement really will be determined by our uh, ISR capabilities versus the enemy's ISR capabilities, or we either can target, shoot first, we'll probably have the uh, a victory in that particular engagement, and maybe the potential war. Uh, unfortunately, when you talk about fleet on fleet, as I say in the article, we have to be very careful because if such a thing ever occurred where we had that Mahanian master battle at sea, we would probably be victorious, but we would not be able to reconstitute as fast as our adversaries. Quite basically, our structure to rebuild the fleet is uh, no longer there, and so we would have to... Um, Think about new ways in what to build to maintain sea control or uh, at least be able to threaten sea control from our adversaries itself. So uh, I think that uh, what we, we will need to move to different areas. Now, uh, an area that I think is uh, underutilized right now, uh, although we have been doing it somewhat, and that is a fleet in, in the sense of applying the fleet in this competitive phase. That is the non-war area. And what do I mean by that is the maritime security type roles. Uh, with the advent of the robotics age, with the advent of unmanned systems, um, uh, applying them across the ISR capability, we have the opportunity to engage allies focusing on maritime security initially. And what do I mean by that is to, for Indonesia or for another country that's concerned about their uh, regional waters, uh, they have to do several things. They have to maintain maritime domain awareness, uh, they have to have the platforms to uh, to actually maintain that maritime awareness and react. And then they have to have some way to uh, uh, respond to any threat in that environment itself. Well, if we would uh, engage our allies with our new systems, uh, new robotic uh, capabilities, manned, unmanned teaming systems to enhance maritime domain awareness uh, in their economic exclusion zones, uh, to enhance their ability to respond, uh, what we're actually doing is building a maritime capability, which is also effective for targeting in war. Um, and so we move from the maritime security cooperation part by building basically a sea denial capability force around critical economic exclusion zone areas. And I think we could actually build that campaign and actually respond to some of the new technologies, while at the same time building a force which, in fact, is quickly reconstitutable in case of war. Uh, so, Jeff, at, at the start of your article, you, you, you uh, I'm going to par paraphrase a little bit, but there's a sort of a warning uh, that, you know, the, the U.S. Navy for the last, you know, as you said, 35 years or so, we've relied on technological innovation, but that tends to come um, multi-platform and highly technical, uh, or, sorry, multi-capable platforms, right, that are that are very technologically advanced. And to build those, they tend to be very expensive. So you end up with a smaller fleet. Uh, you know, this is a little bit Captain Obvious, right? Um, and it reminds me of Sam Tangretti's article that we published a couple months ago, which was Bigger Fleets Win. You know, again, the numbers matter. It's not just, you know, how good your platforms are, your individual platforms are, but you actually have to have mass. You have to have the numbers. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, getting back to uh, you know, your, your a prescription, if you will, for how to, um, how to manage a high-end fight, how to prepare for the high-end fight, in addition to working with your allies and partners and building that ISR network. But what are some things that we can do? Um, what kind of a Navy should, the, you know, should we be building? Should the United States Navy be building? Right. So this goes to the bimodal force uh, construct. And I have to tell a quick story here because it's, it's on my old mentor, uh, Wayne Hughes, uh, who was many of uh, your listeners will be familiar with who uh, created the salvo equations. Uh, and the story on him creating those equations are quite interesting. He was responding to a challenge to, at that time, PA&E, uh, which is now CAPE in the Pentagon, where there was a naval analyst who actually said, uh, Navy, you're building two expensive ships, too few of them. 
you need more ships, more missile bearing platforms, uh, greater numbers in order to beat the fight. So he was actually incensed with that conclusion. He disagreed with it. So he actually went about to show the mathematics where that was not true. Uh, what happened was, as he created the salvo equations, he convinced himself of the exact opposite, that in fact, uh, numbers do count, just as Sam's article brings out the historical reality of that. Wayne proved it mathematically that if you have an adversary who has twice as many ships as you do, that means each one of your ships has to be twice as good in offensive power, twice as good in defensive power, and twice as good as the ability to take a hit and keep fighting. And in fact, in the fr uh, fragility of our ships today, with a single missile or a single torpedo being able to do a mission kill, that creates a highly unstable environment when we build these very multi-mission capable ships. Now, as a Navy analyst, I can tell you that it is most cost-effective to build one platform and to put as many missions in, as possible in that platform until it sinks. And then you lose all those mission capabilities. So uh, we've, been, we've been building a Navy now uh, since World War II, which is really designed for uh, uh, the best uh, capabilities we can afford. And we haven't been thinking about that mass that brings us as far as warfare goes. Uh, and that becomes critical. Now, because we don't expect a larger budget, and I wish we did, I wish we had Congress saying, yes, we need a lot more ships, and so here's the money to do it. What we can do is take a look at our technology, and this is where I discuss the robotics age of warfare. Uh, for since uh, at least 20 years now, Monterey, through a series of articles, NPS through a series of articles, starting with Wayne Hughes's 2008 article on uh, bimodal Navy, and, and then follow-on uh, publications after that, has discussed the, the use of unmanned systems and manned systems paired together to create these networks that I referred to before, to provide an affordable numbers, but yet highly lethal capability. Now, they are good for sea denial, not necessarily sea control. So that's where you get the bimodal concept. You actually uh, divide sea control, which theoretically is two things, getting ships or getting your goods and services through or denying those goods and services of the enemy. So in two forms, one is the, the sea denial force, which is a uh, unmanned manned systems, many platforms uh, integrated with submarines and undersea systems in order to uh, pose risk on any type of adversary who's trying to use the oceans. And then our more traditional force, which has been focused on tactical defense and operational defense for a long time, as your sea control force. Those are the forces that ensure you get your logistics through. Uh, it, that is an affordable force in the sense that for one uh, DDG, I can buy 35 uh, missile platforms uh, and bring a lot more missiles to the fight and distribute those. Essentially, we create uh, a force that is able to execute uh, um, distributed maritime operations affordably. It's reconstitutable and it's responsive in the sense that if, uh, if a new capability of an adversary comes on, I can quickly build unmanned systems in order to pair with manned systems to respond to it, or I can change out packages uh, quickly and I can do so affordably. So that's the sort of vision, sort of the Monterey strategy for the uh, uh, new fleet design, which is that bimodal force, which is discussed in the article. Uh, that's helpful. And I want to, I just want to pull on that a little bit so that if I understand it and our, and our listeners can uh, understand it a little bit more too. So this comes out more in the article, but you, um, your assessment of, you know, fleet on fleet and fleet versus goods or trade or, you know, uh, fleet on fort, um, you, you break it, you sort of break it down into, in, as you just did a little bit, um, you, you know, you talk about the, uh, this isn't your term, but at the stand-in force, as the Marines are now calling it, right, the inside the weapons engagement zone force. And you just, I, I think I heard you say, you know, submarines, unmanned platforms, uh, stealthy, you know, low signature. This is the ability that, you know, inside that anti-access area denial envelope that the Chinese have built in the Western Pacific, in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, right? That's the the force that's going to be able to, uh, get in there and be your sea denial force, right? Put put the adversary on the bottom, um, and then the force that 
you know, of frigates, the Constellation class frigates that we're building and the, you know, the DDGs that we currently have um, and, you know, the amphibious force. Once that area has been sanitized to an extent it is somewhat uh, safer, then you can get that sea control force in there. Did, did, did I summarize that okay? Oh, no, you did a great job of summarizing that. Also, the sea control force is uh, responsible for ensuring that logistics flow to that first island chain. So they have to fight their way across it. In fact, my current scenario, my classes here in Monterey is called the Second Battle of the Philippine Sea. Uh, and essentially, I challenge our students, our officers, to say, here are the current technologies. Uh, here's what our adversary is building to defeat us. Uh, how are we going to get across the Philippine Sea with logistics? Tell us. Uh, what does a convoy look like? What do the deco new decoys look like, uh, et cetera? While at the same time, those stand-in forces, and I'm going to call them maritime stand-in forces integrated with the Marines, are ex uh, executing sea denial capabilities you know, within that first island chain or to the Russians in the Baltics or to uh, other areas. The same force, by the way, which is forward, can also be a port security force. That's my point about you know, the maritime security integration. Think about what you'd have to build in order to deny a sea area in the smaller, more unmanned system construct. Those are the same things you need for maritime security. It's the same thing you need to protect a port in times of war. So uh, in order to build these, we can build upon the, the maritime security requirements and evolve them with our allies to become a lethal forward sea denial force as well. Okay, I'm going to ask a, a, a couple questions because, you know, I, I, I believe in giving credit where credit is due. And so at West in San Diego, our West conference, uh, both the SECNAV and the CNO uh, spoke at length about a lot of topics. But one of them, you know, they were talking about, you know, hey, we, we've got to get to, um, you know, three submarines a year. That's an important goal. Right. And you just mentioned submarines being a real key part of that sea, con sea denial force. Um, they also talked about, and I remember specifically the CNO was saying that uh, in the unmanned realm, uh, they're, they're starting to see some real promise in the payloads that they're putting on some of the, the platforms. So they've got the ISR capabilities, you know, Task Force 59 over in Fifth Fleet is putting a lot of sensors out on the water, right? And they're, they're networking that and they're using AI and machine learning. And it seems like we're making progress, at least in that realm. Um, and then the CNO mentioned, um, you know, the larger unmanned surface vessels, uh, you know, Sea Hunter, but but even the the offshore patrol vessels, the o OSVs, I guess, offshore uh, vessels, su support vessels that they're putting pla um, payloads on, right? They're, so they're putting, you know, maybe it'll be naval strike missiles, maybe it'll be vertical launch capabilities. So when you war game that second second battle of the Philippine Sea. Are you wargaming some of those capabilities and are they in the war games, are they bearing out some of that promise that that perhaps senior leaders think that they are? Yeah. So, Bill, yes, that's exactly what we're doing. In fact, in many cases, uh, our officers are giving given technologies either from the program offices or from the systems commands or from ONR or from DARPA. And what they want us, the, uh, my officers to do is see how they use them and then model and simulate to see what their military value is. Uh, so they are employing this. And I think you're right. We are moving in the right direction. In fact, uh, I just read an article, I believe, uh, in the USNA uh, uh, your uh, news uh, our, uh, outlet uh, that said that Fourth Fleet was going to start to use some of the systems that Fifth Fleet had been developing uh, in order to use for ISR capabilities. So th that's exactly, I think, uh, heading in the right direction. Our, what our officers, and again, I'm going to boil it down to the very essence, anytime you bring more missiles to the fight and can distribute those missile delivery points is a good thing. And, and that I, that's quantitatively over and over and over again that's shown. So, no, we don't need that huge ship with a thousand missiles on it. What we need is, uh, uh, you know, a thousand ships with one missiles on it, so to speak, mainly because that's a highly resilient force. Uh, and it's also affordable and I can replace them quickly and I can deliver those quickly. So, uh, I, of course, that's the other end of the spectrum. You really don't want a ship to only deliver one missile. But the point is that fewer numbers, I mean, many more cheaper, less expensive. ISR capability, make them lethal, and 
tie them in with the manned element. I mean, we have research here at NPS, which is uh, a, pushing the bounds of AI, uh, pushing the bounds of machine learning to be able to add to these systems. But we don't need to wait for that. We can integrate these systems now as long as we have manned platforms integrated with them. We'd be able to deploy those things today. That's uh, that's really interesting insights, and I, you know it, it gives me some hope. I guess um, to your point, you know, a, a lot of smaller platforms with some number of missiles, not hundreds or thousands, on one platform, uh, distributed, tied into, uh, tied together in, I would call it a kill web or a kill chain, perhaps, um, at where the the sensor and the shooter can be separate, maybe by hundreds of miles. Um, now, what's your sense of the ability to build that and, you know, build those quickly? You know, do you think we're getting there in terms of industrial capacity? Well, uh, uh, first I have to uh, jump back to uh, and remind me about the industrial capacity. Um, it's, it, you can build that hundred of miles sensor to shooter distance and large have a, this large kill web. In fact, the U.S. Uh, services, DOD, is trying to do that now. But we're big proponents at NPS of, of underlying building them from bottom up, meaning that these local networks that I talked about, the local manned, unmanned system capabilities, have their own ISR capabilities, their own launch capabilities, so that they're independent of a larger web in case you lose space-based assets. In case you lose your long-haul communications, you can still fight in a region and deny in a region and therefore apply some form of cumulative warfare uh, at the at the very basic and tactical level. So uh, essentially, every, every uh, ship that has a weapon system is able to organically employ that weapon system uh, with its own ISR and its own network capabilities. And the, the research at MPS deals with burst uh, mesh networking so that it's uh, highly uh, uh, both resilient as well as difficult to intercept. Um, but uh, that vision would create many different local areas and local area reconnaissance networks, so to speak, to be able to fight in a particular region. And if you had then your general command and control, if you had that ability to coordinate large ISR assets, all the more better. But most important, fight, learn how to fight in the worst possible position, and that is locally, and, and then build a network that would do it overall. Uh, the reason you brought up industry is a, is a critical point as well. I think we're in a better position in, a, in this country to build these manned, unmanned systems that I just described than we are building mass numbers of ships. Three submarines a year is a great goal, and I applaud that. But I think we could build a lot more UUVs a lot quicker uh, from, our, from other industry uh, support capabilities, likewise surface ships. So uh, I don't think we're tapping the industrial resource that we have here in the United States to build these smaller systems. And we could. Uh, we couldn't build the larger ship industry that now China and, for example, South Korea has without many years of investment and manpower capabilities. But what makes the bimodal Navy attractive, that sea denial force, I believe we do have the industrial capacity to build and replace those quickly. Okay, uh, so here's a point, one of my own personal hobby ho horses, and I asked the CNO this question at West. So I put it to him this way because he was talking about, you know, we've got to be able to, you know, ramp up the industrial capacity, yada, yada, yada right? Um, but I said, look, you know, um, Admiral, uh, right now the Coast Guard has three very productive, uh, you know, capable shipbuilding programs, about to be a fourth, I, I, although I can't judge the, uh, the, the Arctic uh, security cutter yet because they haven't actually started bending steel on it. But um, the offshore patrol vessel is coming. The uh, fast response cutter, uh, it, it, they've been churning those out in dozens of them. Uh, and the national security cutter, I think they're up to like 11 or 12 of those that they've already put in the water. Uh, why couldn't the Navy throw some money behind those programs and keep hot production lines running, upgun them a bit with some naval strike missiles and maybe some other capabilities. And then you've increased the number of hulls. And as you said, the, the more smaller uh, packages that you've got at sea, the, the war games bear out that that 
that leads to lethality, that leads to fleet lethality. So I'm just curious your thoughts on that. You know, if we, if we created some of these national security cutters and fast response cutters and called them small frigates, called them, you know, Navy patrol coastals, whatever you want to call them, um, would that help in the, in the mathematics here? Well, I should ask you what Admiral Gilday responded um, to keep me out he, of trouble. But he said, <laughs> he had, no, no, his, his response was, uh, everything's on the table. Yes, absolutely. And that is the right approach, right? Um, this uh, first, I think the Coast Guard is, and uh, first, your idea is a good one. And I think the Coast Guard is going to have to rediscover a wartime mission. And what I mean by that is if we start to think about it, if you're the adversary and you have undersea capabilities to threaten Kona space ports, uh, and you launch a torpedo, for example, at a ship leaving San Diego, uh, which is heading toward the Western Pacific, we now have to rediscover port breakout operations. Because of that, we have to relearn to integrate with Coast Guard security capabilities, as well as have our own Navy uh, capabilities to do that. So the vessels you describe would be perfect for that. That is, doing pre-ASW search before the high value uh, comes out of port, for example. On the other hand, they wouldn't be necessarily part of my sea denial force. And the reason why is because although they're more numerous with missile capability and lethal capability, they are also more targetable. So we're talking uh, in the smaller realm when we talked about those forward forces with the, integrated with the Marine stand-in forces. Uh, but the ability to quickly build, as you say, and add to the fleet's capacity for the sea control and port security would be critical in this case. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, well, Jeff, uh, this has been a great conversation and your article, uh, you know, is just a terrific uh, addition to the American Sea Power Project. So um, to wrap up, just any parting shots or, or saved rounds from you? Uh, I, again, I just want to compliment uh, uh, proceedings and the Naval Institute for sponsoring the series. Uh, I think we need to inspire additional conversation within the people from uh, uh, all across the country uh, to understand the importance of our, our uh, nation as a maritime power and the uniqueness that the Navy brings to those capabilities, as well as the Coast Guard and the Marine Corps, and how important that is. So uh, anything we can do, like uh, this program, uh, anything we can do to actually get that message out uh, and start to inform the American people on our relative uh, challenges that we have to meet uh, the nation's goals and strategies is a good thing. Well, thanks for your contribution to it, because that's exactly why we started the project a couple of years ago, was just this understanding that perhaps for too long, the United States had taken for granted naval power. Uh, but as B.J. Armstrong wrote in his article about a year and a half ago, uh, you know, American sea power is not a birthright. It's not a uh, it's not a given. Right. Right. Uh, so that's that's you know part of the the ongoing goal of this uh, American sea power project. So, well, uh, my guest today has been retired Navy Captain Jeff Klein. Jeff, thanks for again for writing for proceedings and for your time today. It's been a pleasure. All right. That wraps up another episode of the proceedings podcast brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute since 1873, bringing you an independent open forum for the advancement of sea power. To become a member, go to usni.org forward slash join. If you enjoy the show, ring the bell, subscribe to the channel, tell your friends, and until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.